Turn your Bible, stay open to Isaiah chapter 5. If you need the notes for this morning, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. Preaching through the book of Isaiah. Tremendous book, an exciting book, but one not normally preached through because it does so much challenge to us. It does so much chastening sometimes and deals so much about judgment. But I want to remind you, as we look at Isaiah, I really believe it is a revival book. God deals with Israel for judgment and correction, but then sprinkles in the hope and the challenge that there is something better coming. But we need revival. And we've been praying about that a long, long time. Continue to pray about it. But I believe it is a revival book. Claim the promises. Look for those sprinkling ends of hope as God deals with His people. And again, as I've said over and over as we've been through Isaiah, as God is preaching primarily to Judah through Isaiah, I think it parallels our country. I believe it parallels the Christian church today. Our nation, like Israel, I believe is chosen of God. Now, we've not replaced Israel. Israel is still God's people. I said Israel is still God's people, and the he, he, Bible makes that very clear. But I believe God has called America. God has blessed America beyond measure, beyond comprehension. And just like Israel's main goal was to get the, was supposed to be to bring the world to the one true God, to the Jehovah God, from all the other idolatry. So our country there in the early stages, even our Congress supported missionaries. Can you believe that? Can you imagine somebody wanting to support a Baptist missionary today out of Congress? Boy, it's an amazing thing. But early Congress in our United States did support missionaries, did buy Bibles. Churches were actually having services in the capital. So our nation's founded upon the Word of God, founded for Christian liberty, founded for the work of God, and God is blessed. But at the same time, like Israel, we're so quick to backslide, so quick to get indifferent. And so it is with churches today. So as God is dealing with Israel, He speaks to us. And I trust you're letting Him speak to you as we look through this book of Isaiah. When you deal with God's chastening, passages like this, as God deals with chastening, we need to look at it like going to the doctor, like having a good physician. Sometimes he just prescribes preventive medicine. That's the easy part. Sometimes it's exploratory surgery. Sometimes we open the Bible and he says, let's cut inside and see what we got. Let's go inside and see what's really happening. And sometimes it's major surgery. But both the preventive maintenance, the exploratory surgery, and major surgery, it's all good when properly applied. And the results are good if we heed that and take the doctor's advice. So as we look at the Word of God, and God's tremendous question today, God has for us. Let's let God do the work. Let's let the great physician do his work in our lives. Notice in verse number 1, we find it's the song of the vineyard, the song of the vineyard. Verse number one, now will I sing to my well-beloved the song of my, well, of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard, vineyard in a very fruitful hill. God sings about his vineyard, talking about his vineyard, giving us a picture, a, a parable, if you will, about Judah, about the children of Israel and his relationship. And he talks about his vineyard, and that's what we're looking at today, how God worked in the vineyard, what, how God prepared the vineyard. And the question comes there in verse number 4. What could have been done more to my vineyard? God lays out the fact that he has a vineyard, he has some vines, and he's provided a place, he's worked in a place, but it did not bring forth the fruit he was looking for. It brought forth wild grapes. It brought forth poisonous grapes. And as he asked the question, what more could he have done? That's the question God's asking us this morning. That's the question God's asking you this morning. That's the, God, that's the question God has been asking me this week as I prepared. What more could I have done for you? So as we look at the passage today, you know, smile at me just a little bit, all right? You're looking frowny already. Let's remember, God has done so much for us. God has blessed us so very much. But as we look at that, when the Holy Spirit 
flips your ear, taps you on the soldier, shoulder, pricks your heart, whatever, however he deals with you today about things that you need to put in place, things you need to start, things you need to stop, things that you used to do that you should be doing that you stop, things that you ought to do and you've not been doing, and whatever excuse we have why we're not being what God wants us to be, and all of us have areas God's dealing with. Don't sit there and look at me like you're perfect. There's only one of us in this room like that. <laughs> How's that expression go? Those people that think they're perfect annoy those of us that are. That's right. So, <laughs> so as the Holy Spirit speaks to us, I want God to hear, our, hear His question in our art, hearts and in our ears, what more could I do? God says, what more could I do to get you going? What more could I do to provide a means? What more could I do to get you on the right track? What more could I do to encourage you? What more could I do? That's what God was asking His children of Israel. He said, what more could He have done? What more could He have done to the vineyard? So to this morning, let's let God speak to us, whatever it is, and ask yourselves, what more could God have done? Now, He asked that rhetorically because there's not more He could have done. He's done everything He needs for us. He's provided a way, He's provided the means, He's provided the power, He's provided the book, He's provided the place, He's provided it all and will provide all by faith and God will give us what we need to accomplish what He's called us to do if, he, if we will just follow His will. So this morning I'm going to ask you and let God continue to ask you, what more could He have done? Rhetorical enough so that the idea is stop giving excuses, stop going around the corner, let's get to it. Get to it. God wants to bless. God wants to use. What more could he have done? So no more excuses. No more putting things aside. As God spoke, speaks to your heart this morning about what he, more he could have done. Now, when we think about producing fruit, we are not responsible for all the fruit when it comes to souls per se, but for being the plant God wants us to be so he can produce the fruit through us. We have to be the right plant. We have to be the right vessel so God can produce the fruit through us. And so God looks at us as his vineyard and says, what more could I have done? In your life, I'm asking you right now already, what more could God have done? What more? Let's look at the passage and let God speak to us. I want us to be changed today. I want each one of us to leave here saying, God's done everything he needs to do. Now, God, help me be obedient. Help me let you make the changes in my life. God, please, you work in my life and let me be the soul winner. Let me be the parent. Let me be the husband. Let me be the wife. Let me be the Christian that you want me to be. God, please, because God asked the question, what more could he do? Let's look at the passage this morning. Are you still with me this morning? Well, let God show you he's done everything he needs to do for us. Notice, first of all, we find a delightful passion. A delightful passion. Look what it says in verse number one. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Now, as I've looked at that, I've seen, and I've been trying to figure out exactly who's saying what on that. It could be the prophet singing to Christ. It could be, since there's a transition there, in verse number 3 and 4, it could be the Father speaking to the Son. But all I know is I'm glad call, God calls us His beloved. I'm glad He is mine and I am His. We are beloved. In Sol uh, Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 16, My beloved is mine and I am His. Song of Solomon 7, verse 10. I am my beloved, and his desire is toward me. If you get nothing else out of the message this morning, you ought to just rejoice in the fact we are the beloved. He's beloved, and we are the beloved, and he loves us. What an amazing thing. What a God we have that loves us. What a God we have that calls us the beloved. What a God we have that he allows us to call him the beloved. I'm glad we have a God who wants a relationship and not religion. I'm afraid even in our Baptist churches, we've got to the place where it's religion. I'm going to this church, and I believe this sort of thing, and we do this way, and because that's my religion. Ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't want us to have religion. He wants us to have a relationship. My well-beloved, I'm glad he loves me. I'm glad I can love him. The Bible says we love him because he first, talk to me class, loved us. Well-beloved. What an amazing God we have. What, what other God? When you look at all the other gods in this old world, not real gods, false gods, 
but none of them have a relationship with the people. I was talking to a man just this morning, he was talking about how to witness to some of our uh, Hindu friends who have so many gods and so many things. That's what they have to, what we need to get to them is a heart and understanding that we have a God who wants a relationship, not a religion, not a philosophy, not just a way of doing things, not just uh, certain ceremonies, but a relationship with us. If you're here this morning, you said, you know, this week hasn't been good in my relationship with God. Let's get it right again. Get it right, a relationship with God. So it's a delightful passion. So as he deals with his vineyard and talks about his vineyard and talks about Christ, talks about the Savior, it's all about a love he has for us, the well-beloved. So when God challenges us today through his word, he says, what more could I have done? What more could I have done for my vineyard? We know that he says it out of a heart of love for us. Not out of a heart of judgment, not out of a heart of anger, but a heart of love for us, his well-beloved, and he's our well-beloved. He said, I want to use you, I want to help you, I want to build you, my well-beloved. My beloved, what more could I have done? Many times we hear that and we think sometimes as parents, we think about our kids sometimes that go astray. Oh, Breaks a parent's heart to find a child. Does he move away from home? Gets away from God? Chooses their own way? By the way, they choose their own way. And parents will ask, what more could I have done? Did I not pray with them enough? Did I not love them enough? Did I not talk to them enough? Did I not give them enough example? If you're a parent this morning that understands that, and some of you folks have just got still young children, you don't know what that's like yet, but I pray that you never have to know, but to some degree all parents will learn that. I believe you'll understand God's heart when He says, what more could I have done? He said, I've got this all prepared. He said, I've got my vineyard here. What more could I have done? And yet they went their own way. So as we think about a parent's heart who sees that, what more could I have done? Or maybe a spouse who has another spouse that has their spouse go, go astray. And ask themselves, what more could I have done? And when we understand that brokenness of heart, and that's what he's, that's how, what he's asking there, it's not in anger, it's not in resentment, it's in a broken heart. What more could I have done? That as parents and as spouses, we might understand that. We need to help us understand how God's heart is when he looks at us, his people. When he looks at us, his children. And sees us go astray. Help, sees us not do what we need to be doing and should be doing. And he asked himself and us the question, what more could I have done? It'll help us know his heart. But notice a delightful passion. I'm glad we have a God who deals with us in love. Hello, in what class? In love. It's not bitter. It's not anger. It's not, it's, it's in love. A delightful passion. Number two, I want you to notice a divine provision. As God asks us, what more could I have done? Then the idea is in love. In love, he said, I've done this. In love, I've gone through this way. But he provides, shows us a divine provision or preparation. Notice what it says there in verse number 2. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press and he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? God has given us some great provision. For what God wants to do, God has given us the provision. He said, he said, what more could I have given? What more could I have done? He's given us that great provision. By the way, God has provided and given us great provision. And we need to understand, with, the Bible teaches us that with great privileges come great responsibilities. Are you listening? I hope you parents teach that to your kids. With great privileges come great responsibilities. The Bible puts it this way. Jesus said in Luke twelve forty eight, But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes, he shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whosoever much is given, of him shall be much required. With great privileges come great responsibilities. 
So as we look at all that God has done for us, we look at all that God has blessed us with, when we look at all the things God's going to lay out right there, what He's done for us, with those great provisions, with those great blessings, and by the way, we have been blessed. We sit here overfed and overdressed and, and overplayed. God has provided so much for us and blessed us so much. With all those great privileges come responsibilities. We have some great responsibilities also. As God has blessed this church, as God has blessed your heart, as God has blessed your family, we come, we get the great responsibilities. And that's what God said. I've done all this. He said, what more could I have done? Now, God also warns us about desiring sometimes blessings beyond our measure. It warns us, uh, cautions us about seeking positions for position's sake. It says in James 3, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that ye shall receive the greater condemnation. God was there also teaching that, he said, with the greater re privileges comes greater responsibility. The more you are responsible for it, the more privileges you have, the more you're responsible to it. He says you need to be careful about that. You need to take heed to that. And so as we see what God has given to us, we need to understand we have some great responsibilities before God. I, again, I hope you as parents teach that to your kids. Say, I'm going to give you this privilege, but with it comes these responsibilities. You mess up the responsibilities, you, you lose the privilege. Hello? So we're raising generations that don't understand that. That when you violate your responsibility... You lose privileges. Kids think they ought to have all the privileges. Young adults think they ought to have all the privileges, but no responsibilities. God's going to show us that no. He says, you mess up your responsibilities, you lose some privileges. Notice this provision. Notice the divine provision. First of all, we find a selected place. A selected place. Look what it says in verse number 1. Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. A very fruitful hill. It means the best soil. The best place. It's a place, he said, I've got a vineyard that's in the very best place for producing grapes. I've got a vineyard that's in the very best situation, the very best climate. He said, it is a very fruitful hill. And he's speaking about Israel and the promised land that he gave him. He says, boy, he said, I've got a vineyard. I've got my people. Verse number 7 tells us that's what God's talking about. He's talking about his people and the children of Israel. He said, I've got them. This vineyard is in a very special place, a very unique place, a selected place. And so he said, the children of Israel, they should be very fruitful because I gave them a very unique place to live, a very unique place to dwell, a very unique place to grow, a very unique place to produce the fruit. It's a selected place. He said, what else could I do? I gave them the best spot. What else could I do? I gave them a wonderful land. What else could I have done? He said, they didn't produce the grapes I looked for. They were producing wild grapes, poisonous grapes. He said, but what else could I have done? He said, look at the place that I gave them. Now, are you still with me this morning? God asked us, what else could I have done for you? Let's look at the place God has given us. Wow. I say, wow. So, well, California is such a liberal place. Yeah, the whole world's a liberal place. But what a place. Can you imagine? Listen, honestly, honestly, can you imagine a greater time to serve God? What a, what a place and a time God has given you and I to be born into to serve Him. Can you think of a greater, greater time, a greater place, a greater opportunity to produce fruit? I mean, we have the time, we have the health, we have the longevity, we have the technology. Preacher, I just, I just can't produce fruit. It's just too hard here. Ladies, I'd like to see your knuckles of where they've been scraping on the scrub board. I look at these young folks. They scrub what? Don't have to use the scrub board. Don't have to use the ringer washer. Got dishwashers. I'm not talking about just your husband either. <laughs> you only have a clothesline if you want to have one. 
You don't have to carry water from the, from, the, from the spring. You don't have to make your own bed. You don't have to walk to and from work. You don't have to bring coal in. You don't have to chop wood. We live in a blessed time, in a blessed place, a wonderful, a very place where it ought to be very fruitful. The strength and health, most of us have health that years have gone by would have killed us somewhere along the way. Most of us had some kind of disease or some kind of uh, surgery or something that would have killed us long ago. But now today with surgery, it's just in and out and you're taken care of and you go on for many more years that you would have died long before. What a wonderful place we live. What a wonderful, fruitful hill we live in. You say, preacher, it's just, it's just too hard to be fruitful. No, God says, what else could I have done? He said, look at the fruitful hill I've given you. I'm glad God has given us a selected place. But we're, you're going to leave here and you're going to walk outside. He said, well, it's mighty cold, but you're going to go into your nice car and get the heated up. You're going to go to your house and have some nice soup. And then you're going to go upstairs in your, in your room. My wife kids me because I get cold in my old age now. And I've got my little heater there. I'm gathered around my heater in my upstairs office. And she walks in and goes, whoo, it's hot in here. She says, no, it's good. It's good. We live in a selected place. God looks at you and me and the Lighthouse Baptist Church and says, as far as the place, the time, what else could I have done? You look back just a few generations we look back at them at Moody and at Spurgeon and some of the great evangelists and teachers. All the work they did, all the books they wrote, all the sermons they preached, all the souls that they reached, all that they did by candlelight and on horseback and with only the first generation iPad. What a time we live. A selected place. So whatever excuse you and I have why we can't be fruitful, why God can't use us, why we can't be doing what God wants us to do. You say, well, I live in California. You say, God, what else could I have done? The body and soul and, 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 our, and our mind that He has given to us, it's a selected place. He said, what else could I have done? Secondly, we find not just a selected place, but a secured protection. A secured protection. So God's provided this thing. He said, here's my vineyard. He said, I'm looking for it to produce fruit. He said, I gave it a special place. I gave it a selected place. A, a most fruitful hill. But not only that, He gave a secured protection. Verse number 2. He said, and He fenced it. And gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it. Also made a wine press therein, and looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. So we find the secured protection in verse number 5. And now I go, I will tell you, I will go to my vineyard, I will take away the hedge thereof. So he, he provided great protection. He, he fenced it. He put a hedge around it. He put a tower in the middle of it. He said, I've got it there to protect it, to make sure it's secure, to make sure it's not being destroyed by animals or by robbers. He provided great protection. He said, what more could I have done? So we have to look at ourselves. What do we fear today? We're afraid of our bills. We're afraid of a few odds. But as I mentioned just last week, as far as persecution right now in America, we don't have to fear that. Living here in the Bay Area, for most of us here in the East Bay, we don't have to fear walking down the streets. I may be naive, but I can't think of an area in our little few cities around here that any time of day or night, if my car broke down, I would be afraid to walk in. We have a, such a safe place. No real persecution. No real hindrances. And the excuses we give as far as being fearful or afraid or persecution or problems is so petty. And so small. God says, look what it is. He said, I put a hedge about him. I put a wall, a fence around him. I put a tower in there. God says, what else could I have done? So, again, as we look to our life, God's not doing it out of bitterness. He's not doing it out of anger. He loves us. And he said, what more could I have done? Children, what more could I have done? My beloved, what more could I have done? He said, I gave you a secured protection. So you've got the hedge. We are protected on all sides. We are protected in our lives. We are protected in our homes. He said, I built a tower in the midst. The tower was a place where they could go up and look out in the distance for dangers coming. Looking out from the distance for animals that would come or for marauders that would come. 
By the way, I'm glad God has given us a tower to look out distant wise. We can see the dangers coming right here in this old book. It's a tower that we can see the dangers coming. The preachers and our godly leaders in our, in our, in our homes are the towers that are looking ahead. God says, I, what more could I have done? I gave you a, a selected place. I secured protection for you. Oh, I'm so glad God has given us that, that protection. What more could He have done? Very quickly, a soil prepared. There was a soil prepared for us. Verse number 2. He said, and He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof. If we let God, He'll prepare our soil. Hello? If we let God, He will clean out the rocks. He will clean out the land. He will remove the hindrances. He will till the soil. When he said, I removed the rocks, it makes me think of in the New Testament, Jesus talks about the parable of the soils. Remember that? He said, they take the seed and they put out the seed and the seed would land sometimes by the wayside. In other words, where it's the hard ground, where the birds would just come and eat it. And then it talked about uh, the stony ground where it would come with just enough soil so it would sprout and then the heat would come and it would wither up and die. Then it talked about the thorny ground where the thorns would grow up and, and choke it out. And then finally the good ground where God would get the fruit of it. So God says, I prepared the soil. He said, I went in and I got out the rocks. I got out the stones. I, I plowed the ground. I furled the ground. I got it ready. He said, what more could I have done? I'm glad God, even this morning, is working in our hearts. I trust He's working in our hearts. I know He's working in my heart that He would prepare the soil, my heart, and get out the stones, get out the rocks. Let God this morning in your life, get out whatever rocks in your heart. Let God do whatever He needs to do to get out the, the stones in your life. Maybe a stone of bitterness, of resentment, of anger. You may be sitting there and say, Boy, I hate Pastor Bryson. I agree with you. Well, let me get behind me. All right. I don't like the way he preaches. He preaches too long. He preaches too loud. He preaches too soft. He's too old. He's too young. <laughs> I haven't heard that complaint in a long time, brother. But let's get the stones out. God says, I've provided. I've made a provision for the, us to be fruitful. What more could I have done? So whatever stone it is, the Holy Spirit will work in your life and get it out. Whatever stone it is, whatever hindrance it is, He's got the soil prepared. What more could I have done? But not only that, He gave a set process. A set process for the glorifying of God. Look at verse number 2. And he fenced it, and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, also made a wine press therein. See, he, he's just planting the, he hadn't got the grapes yet. They haven't been producing anything yet. He's preparing the vineyard. He's getting in place. He's setting in the vines. But he said also made a wine press. You say, what's the wine press for? That's for the, when the fruit comes, for the glory to come. When the fruit comes, for the juice to come. When the fruit comes, to get what it's all about. Now that the, to press that and get that grape juice to come out. So that's a process, a mechanism, a vehicle, as we look at this, for the production, for what to do with the fruit. And of course, we know what we're supposed to do with the fruit is give God the glory. He said, so I've got the wine press. He said, I've made it. I've got the wine press. Already the vehicle, the mechanism for getting the glory out, if you will, for getting the juice out, if you will. He said, I've even got the mechanism and the process. He said, where you can get the juice and give God the glory. Because that's what the vineyard master is. The husbandman, he's there to get the juice. He's there to get the grape juice. He's there to get that out of the, the vines. He said, I've given you the process. You say, what process do we have? He's given us the church. Say, so what are you talking about? Ephesians 3.20 Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus through all ages. He has given us the process through the church. He's given us the process through our bodies and through our spirits to give God glory. 1 Corinthians 6.20 But ye are bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. God has given us through our bodies an opportunity, a wine press, to give Him glory. He said, I've, what else can I do? I've given you a nice body. I've given you some strength. I've given you a spirit. I've given you a mind. I've given you a church. I've given a place to serve. He said, it's the wine press. He said, you produce those fruits, and from those fruits can come glory to God. It's the wine press. Let's don't ignore the wine presses God has given to us. 
He said, what more could I have done? He said, I've got a place for you to serve. I've got a place for you to grow. I've got protection around you all around. He said, I prepared the soil. I've got the mechanism that you can give the glory, that you can have. we can have the grape juice come out of that, the wine presses, all the things are set. And so God looks at you, He looks at me, He looks at Lighthouse Baptist Church and says, what else could I do? And the answer is nothing. Because He gives us the free will. He said, I've done this. What else could I do? A delightful passion. Out of a broken heart, a loving heart, God says, what else could I have done? With divine provision. He says, what else could I have done? Notice very quickly a dissatisfied plea. His dissatisfied plea, or you could say a discouraged plea. What more could I have done? I want you to notice it's a reasonable expectation. It's a reasonable expectation. Verse number 2. Made a wine press therein, in the middle part of the verse, toward the end. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. He said, I've done all this. I expected grapes. I expected good fruit. He said, I gave it the best soil. A special place. A fruitful hill. I didn't put it in a bad place and say, okay, do the best you can. I didn't put it in a terrible place and say, I hope it can grow. I hope it can. He said, no, I gave it a fruitful hill. I put it in the right spot. He said, I didn't let just the animals come and, and destroy. I didn't let the enemy come and steal it. I protected it. I got the, the fence around it. And I put a hedge around that. And then I put a tower in the middle to be on guard. I put the wine press there in the middle. So we're all set for the glory. We're all set to produce. We're all set to go forward. What else could I have done? He said, after all, I did all that. Verse number 2. And looked that it should bring forth grapes. Look at the end of verse number 7. He clarifies a little bit more. He says, and he looked for judgment. And behold, oppression. For righteousness. But behold the cry. He was looking for judgment and righteousness. He was looking for good grapes. By the way, do you believe that's a reasonable expectation? You go to work tomorrow. And I hope you work while you're at work. I mean, after your first 14 coffee breaks and your 15 checking your Facebooks and you, you got your snack time and you do this, you might work about an hour out of eight. I hope you as a Christian, you work nine hours out of eight. Oh, are you out there? You ought to be the best employee, the hardest working employee as a, as a Christian in the workplace. But after you work, you expect a paycheck. It's reasonable. To do that. A workman is worthy of his hire, God says. Here we have, he said it was, it was reasonable. He said, I, I got the I bought the land, best land, I prepared the soil, I protected the soil, I put the wine press in there. I expected grapes. It's a reasonable expectation. He said, What else could I have done? Again, I believe God ought to have some reasonable expectations on us and for us. Romans 12, verse number 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable. Knowing what He did for us, it's reasonable. It's not unreasonable to serve God. It's not unreasonable to give our bodies a living sacrifice. It's not unreasonable for us to go to church. It's not unreasonable for us to tithe. It's not unreasonable for us to carry some gospel tracts and invite folks to church and tell them about how to be saved. It's not unreasonable for us to let our children grow up in the house of God and know that God's house is a place where we ought to be. It's a good place. It's a right place. And God's people are God's people. And we're to love and care for them. That we're to respect our elders and respect those that are in authority above us. It's, it's just reasonable. To be a Christian in our life. It's a reasonable expectation. Good grapes. Good grapes. God says, what else could I have done? It's just reasonable. 
So when you and I start to make excuses on why we can't do the next thing God wants us to do, I want the Holy Spirit to say, what else could God have done? Oh, but preacher, I just, I just get so tired and I need my rest. You're going to go home and sleep on the best mattress ever made in the warmest house. Are you, are you out there? You're going to go ahead and you're going to put on a mask so it gets nice and dark. You're going to put on some... Isn't it amazing? It's too loud, I can't sleep. It's too quiet, I can't sleep. So in one, so one room, you've got the noise going in the white room. Or the other room, you've got the earplugs in your ear. It's amazing, I can't figure it out. But you can have what you want. You're going to be well fed. You're going to have a nice bed. You're going to be protected. You're going to be safe. You're not going to have to uh, take watch in the night to make sure no crooks are going to... God said, what else can I have done? It's reasonable. It's reasonable. It's a reasonable expectation. But notice, secondly, with that reasonable expectation, he had a disappointing presentation. A disappointing presentation. Verse number 2. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, good grapes, ripe grapes, plenteous grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Now the word wild grapes there, in Hebrew, it just simply means poison berries. It's not just, whoo, a little tart. No, poison. Poison. Wild grapes. Poison grapes. Worthless grapes. Dangerous grapes. It's a disappointing presentation. He said, what else could I have done with all he's done? What he got was a disappointing presentation. Wild grapes. Question was asked by a preacher years ago. What's worse, no fruit or bad fruit? In this case, could be bad fruit, poisonous. But both no fruit and bad fruit is not what God's looking for. It's not what God deserves. It's not what God is laboring in us for. Again, remember, God's telling us this because He loves us. So, oh, he's beating up. No, no. He says, I want to help you. He said, I want to get things right. I want to, my beloved, he said, I love you. Sometimes the wild grapes, sometimes the disappointing presentation in your life and my life, sometimes it's no fruit. That is a disappointing presentation. We have in our yard, in pots, an apple tree. We've had it now. Oh, I don't know, eight, ten years. We've had, over those eight years, one <laughs> apple. About four years ago. That's because we have a black thumb. One. That's disappointing. No fruit is a disappointing presentation for all that God has done in your life. What fruit do we have? Again, not that I'm producing, but God's producing me. What fruit does we have? Are we disappointing God in the fruit? God said, what else can I have done? Luke 13, Jesus giving the parable. And he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he to the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on the fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why cumbers it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, and I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Giving a picture again of a fruitless tree. In the parable, it was three years. We have to look at ourselves. When's the last time we had any fruit for God? Sometimes a disappointing presentation is no fruit. Sometimes a disappointing presentation is the wrong fruit. The wrong fruit. I don't know if it's in your notes or not. Hosea 10.1. Is that in your notes? All right. Notice what it says speaking about the wrong fruits. Israel is an empty vine. 
See, well, that means it's empty. That means no fruit. Not quite. Notice what he says. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. God says, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth the fruit to me. In other words, he's empty to me. He's empty for me. He's got his own fruit. He's got fruit for himself. He's got fruit for his own desire. He's got fruit for... But he said, for me, it's empty. I'm afraid that's where Christian churches are today. We've got lots of fruit, but it's all for us. We've got lots of fruit, but it's not for God. We've got lots of things in our life that we want, but it's not for God. And so God's saying, what could I have done? Again, in Hosea 10.1, Israel is, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. So he's got lots of fruit for himself. He hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of the land, they have made goodly images. In other words, he said he's, they've got lots of fruit for themselves. They've got lots of fruit for themselves. And because of the good land that I gave them and the fruit they gave, now he said they've given it to idols. Now they've given it to the wicked. Now they've given it to the world. Now they've taken it for themselves. Again, I'm afraid that's where many of us, we have lots of fruit, we have lots of things, we have lots of money, we have lots of possessions, we have lots of time. But as far as God says, when I, God says, when I look at the He says, I see it empty. Because it's not for me. That's why we're to do all for the glory of God. That's why we're to do it with our might for Him. So sometimes it's the wrong fruit. Sometimes, disappointing presentation, as in our text, is wicked fruit. Wicked fruit. Verse number two, that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes, poisonous grapes. Deuteronomy 32, 32. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. The, Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. God deals with the rest of the chapter, and we're not going to get into it this morning, but he deals with that fruit, that those wild grapes in the rest of the chapter. But as we look at our homes, are we producing wicked fruit, wild grapes in our television, in our music, in our dress, in our attitude, in our entertainments, in our habits? God loves us. And as a parent looks at his child and says, what more can I have done? He's not saying that to make us feel bad. He's saying that to call us back. See, here's the goal. Let's rejoice in the fact of what he's done for us. Hello? You sit here this morning and say, well, I'm a miserable person. Well, we're all miserable. But let's stop being miserable and let's rejoice in the fact of what he's done for us. He planted, he gave us a good soil. He gave us a good place. He took out the rocks. He's provided protection for us. He's done all this for us and he's still doing it for us. And we can and start producing the grapes that he wants. Amen! Because while there's life, there's hope, the Bible talks about. And so we must understand that and let's just rejoice in that. Let's don't ignore that. But here God says, what else could I have done? Our answer ought to be, God, you've done all that you need to do. Now, God, let let me do, let you do a work in my life and my heart. And God, I don't want to give you wild grapes. I don't want to be an empty vine for you. I want you to receive the good grapes that you can get the glory through the wine press. So we've got, so don't get discouraged. But just let God make that, help you make that decision this morning. The last thing we hear is haunting supplication. His haunting supplication. Verse 3. And now, so he's laid out his cause. What else could I have done? There's not, what more could I have done for my, my vineyard? And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you. He's praying. He's begging. Twixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? He says, judge. So God comes to us today and says, okay, judge, what more could I have done? He says, think about it. Evaluate it. You choose. You pick it out. You look at it. Again, not for condemnation's sake, but to edify us and build us and bring us back. This supplication, this haunting question is asked. Questions are designed to bring conviction. 
You ask your child a question, boy, often it brings conviction. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 21 as he was giving a parable. He said, but last of all, it was about a vineyard that a man had lent it out and they, the, they had got their grapes and he had sent people to get his profit and they had beaten and they had finally killed one. But he said, but last of all, he sent it unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husband saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him. And let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. The Lord's question was, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh. He's coming. Oh, Jesus is coming. When he cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? So he said, he gave him the story. He said, here there was. He lented out. He made a deal with these folks to, for his vineyard. When it came time for the harvest, he said, come to get his profit from him. He sent one, they beat him up. He sent another, they beat him up. Finally, he sent his son, and they killed his son. He said, yeah, when he comes to do that, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to give him a bonus? He's going to send him on a cruise? No. He said, no. He said, what is he going to do? And so the ones he was speaking about, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render unto him fruits in their seasons. So God poses the question to us today in a haunting way. He says, Judge, what more could I have done? We look at our vines. Are they empty for Him? Oh, we can, we can show all our prizes for kick and shout. You know. I'm not against Joe Jitsu. And the, no, that's fine. Do it. We can show them all our soccer trophies. We can show them our big houses. But God says, but when He says, when I look at your vine, for me, it's empty. What more could I have done? Notice very quickly the deserved penalty. The deserved penalty. So God begins the deal. He asked those people, Jesus asked the, the men there, He said, what will they do with the field? And they said, well, He's going to have to bring judgment. God says, all right, here's, what, here's what's going to happen. He said, here's my expectation. That was reasonable. This is what I got. He said, I got wild grapes. He said, so this is what I'm going to do. He said, this is the result when we do not produce after all God has done for us in parable form. Verse number five. And now go, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Number one, I will take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof and it shall be trodden down and I will lay it waste and it shall not be pruned nor dig but there shall come up briars and thorns. I also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Then he gives the explanation for the vineyard of the Lord is the hosts of the house of Israel and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment but behold op op oppression for righteousness but behold a cry. Deserve penalty. First of all, the vine was going to be eaten up and trodden down. Eaten up and trodden down. So, let me ask you. Have you felt God allowing your vine, your heart, your soul, your spirit to be eaten up? Trodden down? Well, I see so many Christians whose spirit, whose joy, whose peace is eaten up and trodden down. And many times because wild grapes. Wild grapes. He said, all right. He said, I'm not getting, I'm not getting the grapes. He says, eaten up and trodden down. He said, I'm taking away that protection. I'm taking away that. He said, they're going to eaten up and trodden down. Number two, he says, the vine will be laid waste. Verse number six, and I will lay it waste. Wow. So what does that mean? Our life's a waste. I mean, we look at it for the cause of God and say, well, I haven't got anything for God. It should not be pruned or digged. God said, I'm not going to work with it anymore. He said, I've done all I can do. It's not going to work with it anymore. See, that's a dangerous place for the Christian when we get to the place where God's not working on it anymore. So I'm not pruning it anymore. Now in the New Testament, Jesus talked about when we produce, God prunes it. Then it'll produce more. God says, guys, they're not producing anything, so I'm not going to prune it anymore. Oh, it's a dangerous time when God stops working on you. 
Not only that, he said, the vine is going to dry up. There shall come up briars and thorns. I also command the clouds and the rain that they rain no rain upon it. So what happens when we don't produce or allow God to produce in us? We have a Christian life that's eaten up and trodden down, laid waste and dried up. I don't want to live that way. God doesn't want it that way. What more could I have done? Because He loves us. See, preacher, this is hard. God's dealing because He loves us. He said, what more could I have done? Very quickly, let's notice the decision prompted. Let's rejoice in what God has done. You hear this morning, aren't you glad God loves us? Aren't you glad, glad God has put us in a special place? You say, well, I don't particularly like this state. I don't like this, this area. I don't like this. Oh, God says, I've planted you there. I've put you there in a place that you can be fruitful. I've put you there in a place. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a time and a place that needs the gospel more than anywhere else, any other time in our country's history. Hello? We have, you knock doors and you go door to door, person to person. They're atheists. They're blaspheming. They don't care. They don't know about God. They don't want to know about God. They don't believe in God. You say, whoa, that's terrible. No, that is a place where it needs the gospel. Well, we have a place to be fruitful. God has given us health. He's given us strength. He's given us His Word. He's given us technology. He's given us vehicles. He's given us a wonderful, wonderful place to do it. He's given us protection. We can go up and down the streets and knock doors. And the worst thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to slam the door in your face. I've been door knocking you out for some 30 some years and I've only been bitten once. And that little girl, she wasn't bad. <laughs> they don't take... Sometimes I'm out knocking doors with somebody and somebody will slam the door and I can tell they're kind of down or they said, get off my porch. Like the guy a few months ago, he says, get out of here. I'm an atheist, thank God. <laughs> True story. And so somebody will say that and shut the door. So at least they didn't take us downtown and stone us to death on the city streets. Glory. God has put hedges about us. He's put towers around us. He's given us the, the wine press, the place to do it. Let's rejoice in what God has, to done, has done for us and let's produce fruit worthy of the Lord. Wow. Rejoice in that. God says, what else could I have done? Let's just recognize that as God tried to reveal what He's done. By the way, this is the same picture not just for serving God, but also for getting saved. Say, so, well, I'm not saved, but I just don't know. What else could God have done? Say, so, what did He do? He sent His Son. God in the flesh. He didn't send just some angel. He didn't send some flunky. He didn't send some... He sent His Son to become sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. We might be made the righteousness of God in Him. When God saw the travail of His soul, He was satisfied. He sent His Son who paid for your sin. He took your sin. He took all the hell you deserve on the cross of Calvary. What more could He have done? He sent His Word that tells us that. That tells us how if we believe and turn to Him and call upon Him, He promises to save. He sent messengers you may be in church this morning, but you're not saved, but you say, you know what? I've had people talk to me. I've heard the message. I had people praying for me. He sent messengers. He brings the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to your heart. What more could God have done? He slayed His Son. He paid the sin debt. He wrote, his Son rose from the dead. He gave us the Word of God. He sends the Holy Spirit to bring conviction, and He calls you. He says, what more could I have done? Why don't you get saved today? Trust Christ as Savior. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath the vineyard in a very fruitful hill. What more could he have done? Let's be the fruitful vine for God today. And next time we try to give an excuse, let the Holy Spirit say, What more could I have done? What more could I have done? Let's bow our heads, please.